Today on Trinity Sunday, we take one special day to celebrate the worship of the one true triune God, one God, yet three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. As we consider the worship of the one true God, sadly, today we're confronted by many people who who don't worship God, who deny the triune God. Groups of people like um, that still hold to Judaism, to Islam, Jehovah's Witnesses, and the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, also known as the Mormons. Sadly, what all four of those groups have in common is, in one way or another, they all still have God's Word. Some of them might only have the Old Testament scriptures. Some have both the Old and New Testament scriptures. But all of them deny the triune God because they deny that Jesus is true God. So today on Trinity Sunday, the triune God will speak for himself. He comes to the witness stand to testify on his own behalf with these words from 1 John chapter 5, verses 5 through 12. I invite you to stand as we read as follows in Jesus' name. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He did not come by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who testifies, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And the three are in agreement. We accept man's testimony, but God's testimony is greater, because it is the testimony of God that he has given about his Son. Anyone who believes in the Son of God has this testimony in his heart. Anyone who does not believe God has made him out to be a liar, because he has not believed the testimony God has given about his Son. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life, and he who does not have the Son of God does not have life. We pray. Heavenly Father, sanctify us by the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. May be seated. Our Bibles are split into two sections, two testaments. There's an Old Testament and a New Testament. Uh, the Old Testament are those books of the Bible that were written before the life of Jesus, uh, beginning with Moses in about 1400 BC. He really brought or started the writing of the Old Testament, and it ends about 400 years before Jesus. Uh, The New Testament scriptures began, uh, we believe the first one was written around 40 AD, and these are the account of Jesus' life and the account of the early church following his resurrection into heaven. Now, because there is this break between Old Testament and New Testament, many people in our world today look at Christianity as just the New Testament. That Christianity is an offshoot or a break off from Judaism. That it wasn't around until this guy named Jesus of Nazareth came by and started his own religion. However, what we see in our reading today Uh, What the Apostle John is saying to us is he's saying that there is a deep connection that is interwoven through all of Scripture, combining and tying the Old Testament and the New Testament together. 
that from the very beginning there was only one true God, the triune God. And Jesus Christ was the Son of God, our Savior. And so John calls on these three witnesses. He says there are three that testify and their testimony is in agreement. Uh, This is from an Old Testament practice of calling three witnesses into a room. So he says there's three that testify. The Spirit, the water, and the blood. Uh, The Spirit, what he means by that, is the Holy Spirit who inspired all of Holy Scripture. We're told that men wrote the Bible as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So really, they're His words, not ours. And what the Holy Spirit shows us as we study Scripture, and especially as we look at the Old Testament, is this connection of water and blood. A blue cord and a red cord that wind their way through all of Holy Scripture. And so this morning I want to take a moment to briefly expound at least a part of what John is talking about. We start with that thread of water. We're told in in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them. And yet when the earth was still formless and void, we're told that the Spirit of God the Holy Spirit, was hovering over the waters, choosing his favorite medium for creation, water. It wasn't long after God created the world, though, that we fell into sin. Adam and Eve destroyed God's perfect creation, and nothing drove that, the, the depth of our fall so far home as the very first murder. The red cord of Abel's blood that spilled out onto the ground after his brother had killed him. God confronted Abel's murderer and said, your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground for vengeance. (coughs) Abel was the first murder, but there would be many more to follow. We're told in the generations following Adam and Eve, the earth, the world was so filled with violence. Finally, God got to a point where at the time of Noah, he said enough. I need to start over. I need to wash the earth clean of sin and start with a blank slate. And so God sends a flood, a global flood. Water again. He drowns humankind from the face of the earth, only rescuing Noah and his family. And so God uses water to create again. A few generations after Noah, God comes to Abraham, telling Abraham that he is to sacrifice his son, his one and only son whom he loves. He is to lay him on an altar of wood and he's going to, and he's supposed to sacrifice his one and only son And he's about ready to stab him with a knife. And at the last moment, God intervenes. God stops Abraham and provides a a substitute ram that takes his place on that altar. Instead Instead of Isaac's blood staining that altar, it was the blood of a ram that had been caught in a thicket. Abraham's grandson, Jacob, the son of Isaac. Years later, he's entering the promised land. And as he crosses the Jabbok River, as he crosses the water, God gives him a new name. He names him Israel, the one who contends or wrestles with God. But Israel's children, his descendants, were themselves caught and enslaved in Egypt. For 400 years, they lived under the pharaohs until God sent Moses. And in a series of plagues, 10 plagues, God used those plagues to set his people free. The final plague, the 10th plague, God was sending the the angel of death through the land of Egypt. And that angel had authority, authority to claim the life of every firstborn child in the land. 
The only deliverance from the angel of death was a red cord of blood, the blood of a lamb without spot or blemish that would mark the doorposts of that house. When the angel of death saw that blood, it would pass over. God brought the children of Israel out of Egypt. And when they were pursued by Pharaoh's army, God brought them through the water of the Red Sea. He parted the water and allowed them to cross safely, destroying Egypt as it passed behind them. Water and blood. Blood throughout the Bible, and we could keep going on, on its use throughout the Bible, but, but blood is always a reminder of the severity of sin. And the, the only thing that pays for sin, the only thing that saves a person's life in God's eyes, is another life being sacrificed in its place. Water, as it's used throughout the Bible, is always God's creative medium. It, it creates a new beginning, a fresh start, or a new name. When John talks about Jesus, he says, here's the one who came by water and blood. Not only by water, but water and blood. He emphasizes that again and again. And so as we look at Jesus' life, his own ministry, it began with him walking into the Jordan River to be baptized. Here was God's new beginning. Rather than wiping out the face of the earth, which again had fallen into sin, God takes sin and He puts it exclusively on the shoulders of Jesus Christ and His baptism. Where God said, This is my Son whom I love, with Him I am well pleased. Jesus comes up out of the river and shortly after, John the Baptist points him out and says, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. These two cords, water and blood, combine perfectly in Jesus Christ. And John recognized the culmination of those themes throughout the Bible as he looked on our crucified Savior Jesus, as he hung on the cross, and a soldier took his spear and thrust it into Jesus' side. And John makes a point in John chapter 19. He says, out came a flow of blood and water. That here, hanging on the cross, dead on the cross, with water and blood flowing out of his side, was one and the same God who purged the world of sin in the day of Noah. One and the same God who delivered His people safely out of Egypt by the blood of the Lamb. And this God was here working a mighty deliverance, a mighty salvation for all who believe in Him, who put their trust in Him. Jesus says in John chapter 5.39, He says, You diligently study the Scriptures. Because you think that by them you possess eternal life? These are the scriptures that testify about me. He's talking about the Old Testament. All of those stories, all of those pictures that we grew up hearing about in Sunday school. Today, sadly, among Christians, there's a tendency to not emphasize the Old Testament as much anymore. A tendency to not spend as much time learning the stories, learning the characters, learning the events and the, and the pictures that, that God immersed His Old Testament believers in. We tell ourselves that the Old Testament isn't really that important. Or when we look at the Old Testament, we think of all the stories we know best, the flood, the the death of the firstborn in Egypt, God wiping out the Egyptians in the Red Sea, and we say, well, the Old Testament is the angry God. The God that's always upset and angry, and the New Testament is the loving God. That's not true. John shows us today that it is one and the same triune God throughout all of history working for the salvation of His people. He is the God who is justly angered at sin. 
And yet he is also the same God who is loving and forgiving and kind and compassionate to his people over and over again, showing them loving faithfulness, pointing them to their savior, Jesus. And we see this as we study the lives of the Old Testament saints, people like Abraham and Jacob and Moses. They're not perfect people. They were people whose lives were filled with sin, who who struggled with temptation, who wrestled with difficulty and trial and, and death in their life. And their story is our story. Because we haven't changed. We still wrestle with the same problems. We still struggle with the same sins over and over. We still question God's God's love and mercy as we go through the difficult times in life. And as as we face troubles again and again, as we face our own sin and our own shortcomings and our own failures again and again, how often do we sit there and question, how can I be called a child of God? John says here, whoever overcomes the world believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Just as the Old Testament is a story of how all those saints overcame by grace, it's the same with us. Through faith in Jesus, we overcome. And what's neat about that word, overcome, it, it's, the Greek word is Nike. The same Nike that's on shoes with a little swish. It means victory. But what's neat about the word Nike is the Greeks never used it to talk about human victory. You know, when we think about victory, a soccer match or something like that, and and you win a game, we think, oh, I won. But in the Greek mind, they'd say, well, you might lose next week's game, so it's not really a victory. As human beings, we couldn't really have victory because ultimately we're, we're mortal and we'll die one day. So in the Greek world, victory, Nike, had to be given to you by God. So when John tells us, you have victory, you have victory through Jesus, God's Son, who has overcome. He didn't say dead on the cross, but he rose the third day from the dead. And he gives that victory to you and to me through the very same water and blood. Through water, he created us from the nothingness we are, from from the sinners we are, and he's given us a new beginning, a new start, not as the children of Israel, but he calls you the children of God. And he gives you his blood. Jesus held up a cup and said, Behold, the blood of the new covenant poured out for the forgiveness of sins. John says the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all unrighteousness. He comes to us, makes us his own, redeems us with water and blood. Today, the triune God testifies. Not only does he testify that he is the one and the same God of the Old Testament and the New Testament, but he testifies on our behalf as well. Who can bring a charge against God's elect? None. For he gives us a victory through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, our Savior. Amen.